I'm excited to show off something super cool in this video today, which is going to be the rhizome optimizer, which is going to be what we're looking at here, the end result, uh, which is essentially a graph based optimizer. Uh, and I'll get further and deeper into that. But uh, I think it'll be really cool. I think you'll love it. But before we dive into it, I want to start with the ABCs of how I got here. And uh, the graph-based optimizer is based off of AI geometry specifically. So let's start with the ABCs of AI geometry. And within this, the very first concept to understand is this uh, graph that we're looking at here, this 3D graph at the very top. This is the universe according to an LLM model. This is how an LLM model perceives its reality. And it's important to note within here, this is a 3D graph, but graphs can go much higher. They can go 4D, 5D, 60, 200D, but it starts getting really hard to draw graphs beyond 3D. So uh, like there's not really a point. And then so uh, just know that the model lives in this universe, right? According to it, and, and in this universe, it's, graphs and dimensions. And so axes and dimensions, right? And edges and dimensions, which we're going to get into edges, boundaries and dimensions. And so diving into LLM ABCs, there's three concepts within LLM ABCs, ABC, nodes, edges and clusters. So A, nodes. Nodes are the foundational units of knowledge and they're disparate concepts within the model. Think of them as the atomic building blocks representing individual words, phrases, or even abstract ideas. Their, fr their function is, is that nodes act as the anchors in the model's conceptual space. By optimizing how nodes interact, the model can form mo more coherent and more meaningful connections. Up front, I'm not the one that is uh, defining any of this, that's creating any of this logic, etc. I'm interpreting the LLM model logic, right? LLM models are essentially token predictors that predict the next token in a sequence. From there, what we've noticed is that there's emergent capabilities, and the emergent capabilities are that these models are able to understand or dissect the patterns within these words and between these words and understand kind of concepts of these words more than the token itself. And then so this is a breakdown of how exactly the model is able to do that, right? I've kind of dissected that out, like that emergent property where it goes from a token to actual language understanding or word understanding. Where does that come in? How does that happen? It happens via this, nodes, edges, and clusters. So then we move on to edges. The definition of edges are they're the relationships between nodes, representing the patterns and the connections that link concepts together. These edges capture the dependencies, associations, and the context between nodes. Their function is, is that edges are crucial for forming meaning. By tuning the quality and weight of these connections, the model can enhance its understanding of the relationships between disparate concepts making it out making its output more coherent and contextually accurate what does this look like like as an actual example let's say that you have a node and the node is cat the concept of cat right and then so when a model first gets introduced to a word to a concept it starts off as a node and the node has no connections to it so this model this lm model is brand new and we introduce this word cat c-a-t and then it has zero associations, so it's zero nodes. But then we say a cat has fur, so then that creates a connection, an edge, right? A cat has whiskers, that creates an edge, a connection. A cat is an animal, that creates an edge. Uh, and then we create, let's say, a thousand of these edges. And then a thousand of these edges represent cat. And then they're all connected to the node, right? So to the word cat, there's whiskers, fur, animal, hunts mice, etc. And they're all just branching off of the node, right? And this is literally how the LLM model is constructing this within its brain, within the neural network. And then lastly, and the most important part within this, and the part that people are having a hard time of grasping within this is 
cluster relationships within this, right? And then <laughs> to me, this is intriguing and this is a fascinating part of this, but cluster dynamics are, uh, they are, they exist within my uh, Gaussian probability space. Why they exist in there, I don't know. I'm, I would like for someone to tell me why cluster dynamics exists in these spaces, but it does exist in these spaces and the model utilizes cluster dynamics. How does it utilize cluster dynamics? In a very interesting way. Shapes to the model are clusters. So the shapes formed by interconnected nodes and edges. These clusters represent emergent structures, patterns of meaning, or thematic groupings. The shape itself is information, carrying meaning based on its form, density, and fluidity. Function. Clusters capture higher level abstractions by grouping related concepts. The fluid nature of these clusters allows the model to dynamically adjust its understanding, enabling adaptive reasoning across various concepts. And then so this brings us down to the interplay between nodes, edges, and clusters. This is where all of the magic happens. Right? So remember, nodes are isolated concepts. They gain meaning through edges, which binds them into the relationships. So. The word cat means absolutely nothing in and of itself. It's just a word, C-A-T, right? No associations. But the edges are what matters. Whiskers, fur, hunts mice, animals, nocturnal, etc. And then all of these combine, all of these edges combine, plug into the node. And then when they do that, the shape that they create, all of these concepts, they cluster together and the emergent structure formed from the nodes and the edges forms a cluster and they can, this cluster can adapt and it can transform. New information can be added. Maybe the model didn't know that cats have mice. And then so all of a sudden that information changes the overall structure of the shape that the, that the model is dealing with in that instance. And then depending on the strength and the concept, context of the relationships. So within this, the shape can be smooth or jagged, right? It can be rough. The, the shape matters. The LLM model itself doesn't define the shape. It's not conscious of creating these clusters, creating these shapes. It reads the patterns of these clusters and these shapes. It, it puts the data into a hierarchical pattern, and then that's what emerges from that. And then so diving into that, right? How exactly does it put this data into this hierarchical pattern? So putting this all together, right? This is kind of where it finally clicked fully in my brain what we're talking about here. And then so within this, we're talking about graphs, right? But we're not talking about graphs as you would think of them in the traditional sense. An LLM model doesn't think of a graph the way that a human thinks of a graph. This is a graph according to the LLM model. If you know anything about neural networks, this is a neural network. A neural network is a graph to the LLM model. That's how it looks at this. Edges of the graph, the graph can change shape, it can change size, it can change structure. The individual nodes are the individual parameters within the graph. The connections are the edges. And then you have clusters and dimensions. And dimensions can change the shape of all of this, right? And so dimensions act on this. And so dimensions become an important concept of this, right? Dimensions are, uh, you, you can think of them like the connections to nodes, right? The number of edges uh, can, can influence the number of dimensions within this. But so all of these concepts play in very important terms within the LLM model's uh, understanding of the universe in this instance. And then so, uh, with this kind of context and this understanding, I've built out the rhizome optimizer. So typical optimizer functions off of the loss function, right? You want to calculate loss function. Very straightforward and easy to understand. But within this, we have three additional concepts that the model keeps track of. The, the model is keeping track of this information. <laughs> All, like th This is the patterns that the model is dissecting. Nodes, edges, and clusters, right? So rather than just measure loss function, if we can measure how exactly the data is influencing nodes, edges, and clusters, that would be a lot more meaningful data, right? 
So let's come over here and let's examine that in theory and play it out. And then, so in this instance, I'm using small LLM models. So I mean, thank you, hugging face up and down for these small LLM models. Can't thank you enough, right? Because it allows me to do all of this testing with an LLM model, 135 million parameters, and I can test it up and down and we can, we can go through these things, right? And then, so my first test, very straightforward. I built this concept called the rhizome optimizer, uh, which is built on top of the atom optimizer, but it's a graph, it's a graph based, right? And then, so I have a graph based attention mechanism that I feed to the optimizer and then I compute the graph metrics. I compute the loss and then I turn that into a combined loss and graph metrics that gets fed to the model. And then it performs optimization based off of this, right? And then, so you can see what it does is it takes the attention shape and it creates the, the, the graph and the graph based attention here. So we have our attention shape uh, and then we have our uh, loss rate and then measuring kind of what's going on with our loss rate within this, right? And then, so my first test, straightforward, cool. I wanted to get this and then we get our end result of our loss rate our degrees, our clustering, and our density. So going back to the three concepts here, nodes, edges, and clusters, they're represented here, right? So loss, standard, but then average degree, clustering coefficient, and graph density. And then what we can see is that looking at this data, when we train this model on this data, these, these metrics actually do get influenced by that. Hmm, this is curious, right? And then so I'm like, what if we take this apart more? And then we examine this. So my next iteration is to go harder onto this concept of this rhizome optimizer, right? So I go and build out the ultimate test that I can. I give it a full training set. I build out the logic more, build out like everything that I possibly can to throw into this logic that I want it to work. I split up the graphs into four separate and individual graphs. And then I put more information into the graphs overall, uh, create like a bunch more logic, right? And then so what we can see here is it's cool we get it more separated out. So uh, when we go through the steps, we've got our same thing, our loss rate, our degree, our clustering, and our density. But then we can also see how the graph is constructed. So again, the to an LLM model, this, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, to an LLM model, this is the graph, right? And then so this graph can change shapes. It can change size. It can change shapes, etc. And then that's what we're looking at here, right? So graph constructed with 16 edges, 12, 17, 17, 16. It's making different connections. It's it's pruning connections, dropping, adding, etc. So it, it's not just adding them, right? It's not just additive. It will prune. And then as we can see, and then as we go through, we can see it actually, as, as it trains, it adds more more edges, right? And then uh, as it's going through, we can see that by the end of the training, there's definitively more edges in here than there was in the beginning. But something else that happens within this model is, so I'm training this model literally on this data set, right? Like this, these sentences. So it's like the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Machine learning is a fascinating field of study. Neural networks can learn complex patterns, et cetera, right? Very basic sentences. And then I train this for 75 steps, which I knew up front is too many, but so I train it and then it goes through and then we can see our training loss, right? And, and then so looking at this normal, this graph, if I just look at this training loss graph alone and I don't look at any of the other graphs, I can tell you that overfitting occurred within this model. At some point, I trained it too long. When exactly did it occur? I don't know, right? I, I would start um, testing. I probably, I, I would play it safe. I'd cut off at 40, 45, maybe 50 in that range to play it 100% safe, right? I don't know where the overfitting occurred in here, but I can tell definitively that overfitting occurred. Like it's just way too low of a loss rate for way too long of a period of time. But then when we look at these other metrics here, average degree, clustering coefficient, graph density, what we can see, in all of these graphs, it's kind of the same exact pattern where we have everything is, is going smooth and exactly as I would expect within these graphs. And then right around it, you can literally see it between step 25 and step 35, chaos starts happening within here, right? And then step 35 is, is when the overfit occurs. Like uh, if it's like the Simpsons, like in your like, like when did the heart break, you know, and you pause the video, like, Step 35, <laughs> like that's, uh, that's when it happened. 
uh, when, when it's like, this is too much. Like, I, like get out of here. I'm overfitting at this point. And it's just step 35. If I just stopped at step 34, it wouldn't have happened. Yeah. <laughs> like super cool to get that out of this. Right. And then to me, what would, what's the benefit of the rhizome optimizer? It's this, right? If you ever want to know, and you're going through a training set, you want more levers to pull, right? To me, training loss is a, is a, is a lever and it's one lever and it's not a good lever. <laughs> and then, so instead of just one lever, here's four, uh, and then you can pull and you can see these levers and you can adjust these levers based off of this. And then as you can see from the training here, uh, I go from down to like from a loss rate that starts at like 9.0 and then my loss rate goes down. Like I go into the negatives with the loss rate quick, right? Like it, this, this, this thing, it soups it up. You're giving it more dimensions to operate off of, like giving it more dimensions and more data to operate off of. And then putting it essentially in its base language. Like this is essentially like translating everything to assembly language, but for the LLM model. And then you're just like, here you go. Right. Like it, it loves it. <laughs> it just eats it up. Right. And then you can see it with these metrics across the board here. And then, so why would you not use this rhizome optimizer? I think that's important to highlight here, right? <laughs> this is very, very computationally intensive. It, it adds a level of computation to all of this that isn't necessary. Uh, so if you don't need this level of uh, distinction within your training loss, understanding exactly what's happening within it, et cetera, just run your standard app optimizer. This, again, sits on top of the Atom Optimizer, right? So you can run Atom, and then you can run this on top of it, etc. No issues there. And then so pretty cool. I'll leave a link to uh, the, both the uh, doc here as well as the CoLab notebook. So if you want to play around with the uh, Rhizome Optimizer, it's all yours. I release it via MIT license. Uh, if you like this type of content, please like and subscribe. Thank you very much.